Let's go ahead and get started. My name is Carrie Bourne. I am from the Office of Continuing Education at UW-Whitewater, and we have been partnering uh, with Fairhaven Senior Services since 1983 to bring you these lectures uh, by our faculty. As a matter of fact, just today I was going through all the flyers. I have them, almost all of them, going back to 1983, and there have been some really great programs over here. So we're pleased to sort of showcase uh, our faculty again this fall by um, by sharing some of our award-winning faculty and programs. Um, you've got to hear a lot of different topics, a lot of diff different types of presentations. Um, and today is our only science presentation, uh, science-related topic of the series. But let me go ahead and uh, introduce today's speaker. Uh, today's speaker is Dr. Rex Hanger. And he, uh, he says, growing up as an army brat, Rex Hanger's family moved almost every year from one military base to another for his father's career. By happenstance, in every location, he was always near localities where he could collect rocks and fossils outside. And so he has known he wanted to be a geologist and paleontologist since elementary school. His professional training began at the South it began in the South at Texas A&M University where he received his BS and MS degrees in geology. He then moved west where he completed his PhD in paleontology at the University of California at Berkeley which was followed by a cross country trip back east for a postdoc in paleobiology at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington DC. To complete his tour of all four geographic quadrants of the lower 48, he then traveled north and did a one-year visiting professorship at UW-Madison and finally landed his tenured position at UW-Whitewater, where he has taught for 23 years. His research interests are in fossils of all ages, and of course, he loves teaching about them to his students. This has been recognized by winning teaching awards from the College of Letters and Sciences, the University of Wisconsin-Whitewater, as a whole and culminating with winning the 2019 UW System Board of Regents Teaching Excellence Award, the highest award offered in the entire state system and the only paleontologist to ever win it. So please welcome Dr. Rex Hanger. Thank you for coming out today on this beautiful fall day and spending a little time here uh, learning a little bit about what I do and the science that I work on and really just seeing how I take a subject that not a lot of people know a lot about, geology, rocks, fossils, and make it interesting for our students here in Whitewater. So the topic today, significance of reefs, and by reefs I think of Coral reefs. You know, if, if you go to a travel agent and you say, I want to have a vacation and see some reefs, you know, they'll send you to the tropics somewhere like this, an island. And this picture is supposed to be an island here and then diving into the water and there's a bunch of beautiful corals and sponges and fishes and things like that. We all have an idea of what a reef is. Lots of beautiful life, warm water, vacation land, if you, if you, don't, like, if you don't want to go to the mountains. But how I and my students study reefs is a little bit different. So now here's where I'm from, central Texas. Although I was born in Germany, like I said, army brat, born in Heidelberg. But my father's last duty station was Fort Hood, Texas. And the area around here sort of has this general look, low rolling hills, rock exposed here. And for me, these things were filled with free toys. You know, as a kid, you have, to, you have to pay for Legos. Your mom has to buy Hot Wheels, you know, it's money, money, but free toys. Rocks and fossils, beautiful things, and my mom had to suffer with me bringing home all this stuff all the time and filling the house and every possible spot in the yard with rocks and fossils. My father, the army colonel, he never believed that I could ever get employed doing such a thing. He became very happy when I landed here in Whitewater. Anyway, going to a place like this is wonderful, nice. You can see it's a nice place to hike around. Uh, the type of area that would starting start getting my eyes bugging out would be like this. Here's a hillside, 
and it's cut into here and you see the rocks and it sort of looks like a bunch of layers, layer cakes, and that's the stuff that I want to see. And then, of course, one has to go up here and then look for specimens, look for things. So very different than the beautiful tropical water scene that we were showing before where you're swimming and snorkeling around. This is rocks, dirty hillsides, things like that. And here's where I always give thanks to students. Ah, youth. I have one in this room here right now, Chris. Uh, not He's not in this photo, but... Uh, you know, it's nice to be able to point over there and say, you guys pick that up. <laughs> Put that in the van. Uh, go up there and get that one up there. Uh, and so I make use of that. And sometimes we can bring home huge, huge loads. This is a picture in the lab downstairs in Upham Hall on the campus. These are all bags, and there's that rock that you saw those boys carrying, but big bags of rocks, and we'll come back with 700, 800, one time over 1,000 pounds of rock. So lots of rock, lots of rock, lots of rock and fossils in there. This is a crazy map here, but I'm going to sort of take you now. Let's, let's step back before I go into that. They look just like rocks. And again, that's how my father first would see these things. He'd say, you're just collecting rocks. And I'd say, yeah, but this is an ancient reef, and this is an ancient river, and this is an ancient... It, th rocks tell a story. Just like a person tells a story, a geologist is a person that kind of translates it from the rock to you to tell you how, how we know about what these rocks are. So things like this... Tell us about times long ago. If you look at this map, it looks like the globe, but it looks a little different. So the continents are not in the same places. The oceans aren't in the same places. And this is the world about 100 million years ago uh, where we're going to go down to Texas. And I, So here's more a map of the United States. And Wisconsin is right up there. I know it might be hard to see and ignore a lot of these words. You just need to see... Wherever there's brown, that was land. Wherever there's blue, that was ocean water. And so huge parts of North America were flooded by water, ocean water. How do we know this? Because we can go to these places in Texas, Kansas, Nebraska, the Mont Montana, Wyoming, Canada, and we find fossils of corals of snails, of clams, of fishes, of sharks, things that lived in ocean water. You know, there's no land shark. There's no coral that lives on land. They're in the water. So if you find these fossils, it says, boom, an ocean was here. So now I spent a lot of time in Texas. It's where my youth was, a lot of my youth. And uh, it makes for nice trips where I can load up a van of students and we can get down there in a couple of days and do some of this work. So if we zoom in here in this area in Texas, again, very, very complex, but there's sort of the lone star shape of Texas, again, showing the different areas of blue, and there's sort of the ocean had deeper areas, shallower areas, all of that, and all of this would have had different reefs those places with all the life forming on it. But then if you go to the edge, it drops off into the deep ocean and it becomes important for another thing. Here's a clearer map of Texas. Everybody recognizes the shape of Texas, right? The Lone Star State, uh, but without all the cities and towns and everything. Uh, the area that's sort of colored in light yellow those are the age of rocks that contain the fossils that I'm talking about. And the area I've circled, they call it the Lampasas Cut Plain. There's a big river there called the Lampasas that has cut through the rocks conveniently for us. You know, if you think back to that picture I showed of those layers of rock, I always try to make an analogy for the students. It's like cutting into a layer cake, right? Right? And you pull out that cake and you see the different layers that mom baked for you or whoever. You know, so it, and the earth is like that too. We have these layers of rock that we can collect. And here, this river has cut through and exposed a lot of these things for us. So it becomes easier to collect. 
Now, this is a very complex map, but I, I had to put it up here just to show Fort Hood, Texas. It's now been renamed to Fort Cavazos. Hood was a Confederate general, and so they renamed it to, yeah, it, it was part of the renaming process. But the outline of this, this is 340 square miles of military base. Uh, I know you can't see it, but this, this bullseye right in the middle is the impact area. They, they shoot off live ammunition there, and it's one of the largest tank armored divisions in the whole country right there. There's a lot of activity right there. I'll never be able to go into there. But all around it, there's towns like here's Gatesville, here's Copper's Cove, here's Killeen. And when I first moved to this town of Killeen down here, there were just about 20,000 people there. Now there's over 250,000 people. It's one of the fastest, it, it, for about a whole decade, it was one of the fastest growing cities in all of the United States. And that's up there with Las Vegas and, and some of these other big cities, mostly because of Fort Hood. So the second largest federal government payroll outside of Washington, D.C., every two weeks that big plug of money goes to all those soldiers and their families at Fort Hood I'm just going to say Fort Hood instead of Cavazos. That's just what I'm used to. Uh, and so the growth is enormous. There's good and bad to that. The good is that it means that all, of the, all around here, but especially in these points here south, there's construction all the time. They're basically plowing into hills, building highways, dynamiting things, exposing what I want. And it's pretty easy for me to just, oh, I'll put on a hard hat and a vest and kind of pretend I belong and go in and get fossils or get permission. The bad, the flip side of that is that, well, it's exposed for a few months and then boom, they built another mall. They built another lanes on this already six lane highway, things change. But if you get, that's why, that's why I always say, because my, my, People always say, well, why do you bring so much? Why do you collect all this? You have to. Otherwise, it's paved over. It's gone. It's gone. So let's go here and look at reefs again. Here's a map of the globe of the time, and everywhere you see the blue pattern, it's sort of the tropics then. You can see in Asia, Africa, South America, but North America, it's here in Texas. And again, what I'm going to show you is as you go up through these layers of rocks, you're going to collect rocks. I'm going to show you some beautiful pictures of fossils. And we're going to go from when the seawater first starts creeping up and covering the land till there's time of building these reefs. And then we want to talk about the killing of these reefs, the death of these reefs. Reefs have been called like the canaries in the coal mine. You ever hear that term? I, I ask my students that, and a lot of them go, "What?" You know, they, they don't know. They don't know. Some, but 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 for the oceans, they're a good barometer of how healthy things are. And I'm going to show you these reefs. They were bountiful. They grew. They did all this. Then they died. And what does that help help us when we're talking about what's happening with reefs today? Okay, so place like this, and then you'll see, I put up here, don't worry about this so much, but of course, we love naming things, geologists, paleontologists, and so we even name these different formations. You see this one's sort of grayish, and it's called the Walnut Formation, because they first described it at a place called Walnut Creek, and this is the Comanche Peak Formation, first described in a little town called Comanche. If you're the first one describing these rocks, you get to name them, and so a lot of people want to <laughs> want to do this. I call this the target section because now it's gone. There's a target on it. You know the store target? Yeah. So they cleared out the backside of this hill, they built the target, and then this retaining wall, they went ahead and covered the whole thing. But we got a lot of fossils out first. We got a lot out first. An overly, overly complex diagram, but I wanted to show you again the whole concept of a layer cake. Look at this layer cake. This has hundreds of layers. These are these layers of rock in, I'm going to step up here rather than just pointing this little thing. Layers of rock, the different colors are different types, and this is sort of many miles across central Texas, 
And then notice as you go way out here, all of a sudden, things change. Way out here, this is not exposed. It's deep in the subsurface. And here's why these reefs have been important. We all associate Texas with oil, or as they say there, oil, oil and gas. Uh, some of the world's largest oil fields, oil and gas fields, come out of this stuff. That's a reason why geologists love reefs. They, are, they hold petroleum and oil. And whether we're going to step away from that in the future or not, it brought us to our civilization now. You know, it made us it, the advanced societies that we are, and maybe we'll have the luxury of stepping away in the future to renewables, but we're not there yet. And so in a place like this, students can study rocks and walk right up to them, but then that helps tell them, ah, how is this going to be 3,000 feet down a few hundred miles away? where we're drilling to get the good stuff. So a lot of geologists and paleontologists in Texas have cut their teeth on learning the geology of these rocks and reefs to talk about the ancient ones. And this isn't a minimal thing. So again, there's the outline of Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and this weird little sort of snake-like thing going across here. This is the front of what would have been the Great Barrier Reef of the United States at this time, about 110 million years ago. And this is the stuff that is one of the largest oil reservoirs, not just in Texas, not just in North America, but in the world. Besides the reefs on the edge, then, there were sort of reefs and smaller things up here that are easy to study because, again, you can just drive up, get out, and there they are. So then we'll so now we're going to start looking at some stuff. So right off the bat, there's my shoe for scale, a size 11, and you're looking at a dinosaur footprint from one little town near there. So now a dinosaur is a land creature. So at the bottom of these layer cakes, there's evidence of di there's dinosaur bones, there's plant fossils, there's tracks like this. But remember I said the ocean is going to flood in. And then it's going to start covering it up, and we're going to get to these reefs. I have to put a picture here just to show you some of the, the sort of conditions. I always have to warn the students, there's cactus. Wisconsin kids don't generally know a lot about cactus <laughs> and the needles. And not just the big needles, but the billions of little teeny tiny needles that get in and put. And so... Again, it's a hazard, that and the snakes and scorpions and all the other things, but the cactus are there, and so this is one of my former students, and she's working here. You have to kind of dodge yourself around this stuff. Another little hazard that's there. And this is sort of what you see. And again, most people would look at this and they'd go, it's a rock. Yeah, I see some little strange round shapes there, some curly cues or whatever, but see, to my eye, and then the students, you start saying, okay, well, there's, that's the remains of little animals. There's some shells. There's some pieces. There's the first sort of things that identify this as an ocean deposit. And right off the bat, we get these weird things called peruviella. Now, on the scale over here on the side, those are inches. So that's like four inches. That's a big snail. The name of it, and there's going to be a lot of these crazy names. Sorry, that's just how we are. <laughs> Peruviella. It has the word Peru in it. It's found in Texas and Peru. It's two sides of that ancient ocean, and it represents the first ocean waters creeping up and starting to flood the land on both sides there. And so we get a lot of these things. And these things actually are pretty interesting because... The uh, Comanche Indians, the native Indians uh, in the area, uh, used, the archaeologists are interested in this too because they would pick these big things. I don't know if they knew what they were or whatever, but it was still of interest to them. They would take them, and there's several sort of um, middens and um, fire pits where they line the fire pits with these large fossils. So again, there's no record, obviously, of, of them knowing what they were, but they used them. And so they're among our first paleontologists. 
Anyway, back, the, what, what do we do with them? Bring them back. There's a lot of work to be done. So I don't just use the students for camel horse labor in the field. Um, sawing, so here there's a rock saw, and this stu these two students are lining up to saw rocks. Uh, she has been soaking this in a solvent, and she's now sieving this. You have to do a lot of stuff back here, back here at Whitewater. And I've got two labs here, and I work students through these things, and they get a lot of good fossils. So what do we get? So just a few other pictures of some of these things. And again, you'll go, well, what is it? We, if you, you know, to the trained eye, you can sort of see it, and you'll see my hand and my wedding ring in a lot of these pictures. I like it for scale. But these weird little donut-type shapes here, they're the same sort of little burrow holes that little shrimp make on tidal flats today. And sometimes one can even sort of slice into these things with a rock saw and find little fossils of these little shrimpy things in there. So it's, it's, it's just, it's more evidence of this thing. That one in particular comes from what I call the Chick-fil-A section because they're in Killeen, Texas. There, oh, there's the drive-through for Chick-fil-A. The Chick-fil-A is off here. Uh, and they kind of plowed out this area as a drainage pond area, but conveniently for me, I see there's gar there's a there's a washing machine, there's garbage, all this. But you know, I have the students go in there, <laughs> collect fossils, and so wherever we can get it. Again, during all this this huge expansive phase of this this town, you go get fossils wherever you can get them. Here's another one. I call this the uh, high school. This Harker Heights is a little town next to Killeen. This is where they built a new high school. You can see the suburban homes popping up here. The, this is now the tennis courts of Harker Heights High School. But for a while, this was a glorious place to collect evidence of these fossils. And what do we get? Well, I love snails. Look at the, I mean, everybody in here can tell that those are snails. Now, those other ones were kind of weird, but here's these spiral snails, and of course, we give them different wild names um, like this. S lots of snails. These are what we call heart urchins. They're like little sea urchins, but shaped not perfectly round, but like hearts. And I put this picture up here just to give you an idea of how many hundreds you can get by just sitting down and collecting for a short amount of time. Again, but see, we're both, we're getting evidence that here's ocean creatures and the water's getting deeper. Here's a regular urchin. So there's a sea urchin, sort of a pin cushion look. You can picture all the little spines coming off of the thing. Again, these are sort of centimeters here. So each sort of green and white block would be about an inch. Again, ocean type creatures, clams. Lots and lots of things. Again, the evidence starts piling up that the ocean was there. It's getting deeper and deeper. There's a shark tooth. It's a little one. <laughs> but people always want to say, well, are sharks there? Yes, sharks were there, but not, we're not talking giant big sharks. But still, you know, you can recognize that as a shed shark's tooth. And again, it's evidence that the ocean was there and creeping upwards. So we're talking about, we're following environment. This is the dentist office section. That's where I got it because it no longer exists. It's a dental office. So they work with teeth. They were pretty cool. They, they said, you mean there's teeth under here? I said, well, that, yeah, but you're never going to see them because your parking lot is on it now. But that's it. So uh, this is the HEB section. So it, for those of you that know, HEB is the most glorious grocery store in the world. They're a big chain in Texas, uh, best barbecue you can imagine. And so the big grocery store here, they cut out this little hill, and oh, my mother sent me there to get some things, but I lost track of time collecting fossils off on the side here. And you can see my hand has these beautiful little ammonites and stuff. And she, she knew what the story was. She knew that, okay, <laughs> you found something to pick up and look at. And you can go other places and find even bigger fossils. So these things have a diameter about like this. These are ammonites. So these are things like the nautiloid, like the swimming nautilus. 
And that's telling us that this water really got deep. So the ocean came in, flooded Texas. You saw it, went all the way from Texas up to the the North Pole, basically all the way through North America. And we find these things like this. Talk about reefs. Along with all these things, we start building reefs made out of oysters. Whether you eat oysters or not, you know that they are a multi, multi multi-billion dollar product today. And oysters are another thing that's, they're suffering today environmentally. You know, the Chesapeake Bay oysters are dying and suffering. Here's another chance. If we want to know how oysters live and how they die, how they get killed, we have these ancient examples to look at. And here's one of them. Uh, This is called Tenastrion texana. Uh, Again, you can see it's about as big as a human ear, kind of looks like the ear of a troll or something like that. But this would form huge masses in this area and elsewhere of these oyster reefs. And then this one, colloquially, it's called the devil's toenail, because doesn't it look like a really gruesome, hard-to-clip toenail? And these things are found by the, I'm, I'm not kidding, the billions upon billions upon billions. These things were, these were great times for oysters and oyster environments building up these big reefs. And so we collect these, and here's just a picture of sort of a, one of my little armies of students collecting, and these, these rough beds here are from what's called the Texagryphia oyster beds. And these things, they go into the earth underground and underground, they are big oil reservoirs. So by studying them up here, we can predict and make predictions of them in the, in the, the lower area. And that's the first simple answer of why, why talk about reefs at all? When my father would say, ask me, well, why, why would anybody want to know this? Well, because it literally means money. It literally means billions upon billions of dollars and wealth and everything else. That's the crude answer. I just love them because they're beautiful fossils and represent some things. Again, a closer picture of a place where I could take students, and you can see here's one type of rock, here's another, and we'd have them collect in these different places to mark these changes. Uh, of course, you know, I get up there, I tell them, sit down, plant your face up here, look close. You, gotta, you can't just walk and say, oh, it's rock. You got to get dirty. <laughs> and, you know, some students like getting dirty, others don't want it at all, but we all have to. Uh, evidence that the ocean's getting deeper, and again, the students collecting, working hard. Sometimes, you know, and I'll take th- students there from Wisconsin, but it's Texas weather. And yeah, it's, it's pretty withering. I make sure they have enough water and break time and everything, but yeah, the, they're usually complaining about the heat <laughs> and the temperatures, but it's like, well, that's perfect. That is perfect fossil finding weather because they're out there. You can spend all day if you're watered up enough to do it. I like this. Here's a satellite picture just to show you. Now, these students, are, the, you see where they are right here. That is right there. There's a hillside, and then you see all of these are these sort of cookie-cutter homes. Everything's the same, a little three-bedroom, two-bath, and they build. And so that that area where that was a great fossil site, well, now it has five homes on it and covered up. And they build right up to the hill and cover all this up. And I said, Killeen's one of the fastest-growing places in the country. All of this great stuff, it gets exposed, then it's covered up. But you can still find cute little things. And here's a little thing called anethia. This is like a scallop, you know, the shell oil symbol or whatever. Well, that's that, that's that shell over there. It's a, that's one of these little, and if you've ever eaten scallops, well, there's its ancient ancestor, the anethia. Collecting here, we call this the water tower section because now it has a big water tower built upon it, and it's covered it up, covered up. And then eventually you get to the next formation, which is the Edwards, and that's where we start getting into reefs. And again, here's a cartoon to sort of picture this thing. So if you take all the different fossils that I've shown you and try to make them alive by stuffing an animal in it and doing all this, 
we like doing that. Uh, you get these sort of artistic renderings. You're underwater, and here's what these ancient reefs probably looked like with these things. And if we go and start collecting, looking, you know, we have these weird little things called rudists. They're not corals. They're clams that wish they were a coral. They grew into a coral shape. You know, most clams, they, you know, they open and close, and the left side is the same as the right side. These are more like those garbage cans, you know, that you step on and the lid goes up. One side grew real big and long, and the other side is like the little flapper on the garbage can. Isn't that weird? They don't exist anymore today, but they were the coral, they were the reef builders at the time. If you actually finally go to the reef rock, well, you have a hard time actually finding or getting good fossils because they've been what we call dolomitized. Chemically, they've changed, but look at this. You can see this. It kind of looks, it's very holy. Can you see all the holes and everything? That's what I'm collecting it here or here, or here, but in the subsurface, those holes are filled with oil and gas. You drill into that, <laughs> apply pressure, and you can suck out the goods, the grease, the oil, <laughs> as they call it. Anyway, so we can go around, we, can, we examine and collect these reefs, uh, this is an area that's called Wright Ranch. It's bordering Fort Hood. So Fort Hood is right here at one time. Uh, so this is a satellite view. Here's a highway. And you can sort of see this area has been cleared here. Uh, one of the rounds was fired over here. It caused a fire, <laughs> which burned a large part of this person's ranch. The government said, oh, what can we do? What can we do? He said, I want a new road. I want a new fence. I want you to clear the rest of the brush. I want a new well. I want. To, they just wrote the check and did it all. Conveniently, uh, I made friends with these people, and you can get up here. That's a cell phone tower now on top of the hill. So, so there's the sort of highway. This kind of goes up. That's up a pretty steep hill. That's a cell phone tower. And there I've overlain it. These are these different formations, these different rock types, and these are tracking that change from sea level first coming, getting deeper and deeper and deep water filled with those ammonites, those nautiloids, and then this Edwards formation contains those reefs. And if you look close, here's that cell phone tower. Look at these sort of bullseye type patterns up here. It's no longer just straight like layer cake rock, like a stack of books. You have this pattern here, and there's your modern analogy. So in the Baha if you take a vacation today to the Bahamas, the Virgin Islands, the Florida Keys, there's all kinds of what we call little patch reefs. They make little hillocks, and sometimes they're actual islands. Well, there's your ancient examples of this. Pardon? Oh, I, heard, I thought I heard somebody. Uh, really difficult to study this stuff. A few years ago, I was lucky. I had two young veterans and a couple other strong guys. I said, oh, we're not just going to carry rocks. We're going to bring a drill, a big rock corer. And we have to climb up this mountain, carry the drill. We have to carry gallons and gallons of water up here as coolant and we're going to core this. So they're taking a rock drill and literally drilling core as they're holding it. And of course, they, I challenged them and they challenged each other to see who could do the, you know, you can do that with some of the guys. <laughs> anyway, um, so we get some cores. We actually can study this. There's a lot of little caves in these depressions. And the beautiful thing here is that we were able to find what we call silicified preservation. I know that's a crazy word. It just means that these fossils, I don't just have to bust the rock and do all this. And here's some pictures of them. So there's that hand again. You see that same ring. And you can see sort of little ghostly impressions. This is a giant clam called Chondrodonta. Can't really tell much of here, but except I can. There's shelly things Here's another one. But if you take these and put them in acid, 
The acid is, so here's a bubbling vat of acid. The acid boils away the rock. And here's when I pulled the thing out. You can sort of see the fossil shells start popping out. Boy, it's a convenient way to cheat. It's a, and, and it doesn't happen in every place and everything, but here we were lucky with this, and we could pull out. So here you just see a big block of rock. Yeah, you still have to haul it back. But in the lab then we do, and I go through many, many hundreds of gallons of acid yearly. Not so much now, but I used to. Uh, and then you can pull out individual fossils and study these things. And sometimes they can be quite detailed and beautiful. And so this is a picture from a paper we did a few years ago with, there's a coral, but then there's also these weird, there's those sort of flapper clams and snails and all of this. We get all of these glorious reefy type creatures. But the good times don't last. So where this student is standing there, that has reefs, but right above it, everything suddenly changes. So everything I've told you so far has been, yeah, the earth is getting better and better and there's reefs and things are getting bigger. It ends with this thing that we call the Kayamichi Formation. If you go to it, it has completely different animals. Now, this is a weird thing. Waco Nella Wacoensis. Can you guess where it was first found and described? Waco, Texas. Yeah. Uh, actually, very close to uh, Crawford, Texas, where President, the second Bush president had his home for many, many years, and also very close to the Branch Davidians. Their play. They have these exposed on their area, too, if you recall them, David Koresh and the... But again, a hammer for scale, all of these things. These things today, they can, they, they're evidence that oxygen starts depleting. Think about it. If oxygen starts leaving this room, we'd all be suffering. Same thing with ocean creatures. And that's one of the things that we fear today, that with increased CO2 in the atmosphere, increased temperatures, it drives ocean temperatures up and drives the amount of oxygen in the ocean down. And here's our evidence of this happening in the past. So you get this, these weird faunas of these odd little creatures that can tolerate hardly any oxygen. All those other things are dead and gone. Or they become miniaturized. So this is one of my former students, Melanie, and then my face through there. So this was the, she won a big international award because uh, my students win a lot of awards and do things too. And um, that was Craig Schreiner, you know, our photographer from campus, his sort of artistic way of presenting this thing. This is how big these things normally are. The environment changed, and the same species are stunted and miniaturized. These are millimeters, these tick marks here. It's evidence that times are getting bad. You know, if you don't have the same amount of nutrition, same amount of food, you don't grow as big. That's why we you know, think about our ancestors a hundred years ago, a thousand years ago. They were much smaller, shorter people because they had diets that weren't as glorious as ours. But these things get stunted till eventually die. What killed these glorious Texas reefs was what we call oceanic anoxia, basically deprivation. They didn't have enough oxygen to survive anymore. They've left their legacy of great geology for us to study and oil and gas to fuel our rise to first world status, industrial revolution, everything, but they're gone. End of that story. What about locally? Do you know what? Right here in Wisconsin, we also had ancient reefs, but much, much older. If those last reefs in Texas were 110, 120 years ago, a million years old, here, these are from what we call the Silurian period, 
which for the ones we're relevant to, these are things that are over 400 million years old. Again, evidence that you can go find ocean critters right below our feet. And I literally mean right below our feet here. Now, here it's not the reefy stuff, but when they were building that business temple, the big business camp building on campus, Highland Hall, my science building across the way, Upham Hall, had, I had to look over there every day as they dynamited the hole and dug and deep. I put on the hard hat, got a clipboard and a vest to look official because they didn't want to let me in at first put all on that on, nobody said a word. And I actually was able to go in the hole and collect a bunch of fossils and everything. What did I collect? There's corals, a little fragment of a fish tooth, there's snails, clam, evidence that we here in Wisconsin were covered by ocean rocks. Now this, it's, it's very hard to see, but there's an out, that's an outline of North America, that's, there's Alaska, California, Mexico, here we are, sort of Wisconsin, and then these weird little blobs are telling us that here we have evidence of reefs. These are different reefs, but again, we have artists that draw little things here, and we have all kinds of cool things. This is sort of the artist representation of what the living seafloor would look like, but then the cartoon of what the rocks that you would dig out and find are like, really. Where do you find these? Well, now here's a map of the globe during this Silurian period, and none of the continents are where you would think them. North America is actually mostly in the southern hemisphere. I always tell people Wisconsin was a tropical paradise in the southern hemisphere, covered by ocean water. And we have lots of evidence to support this and do this, but everywhere you see the little dots, that's where reefs would deposit. Let's zoom in a little closer. There's the glorious state of Wisconsin. There's Illinois, Indiana. And everywhere there's this sort of light bluish, greenish color, and then the other blue, that's ocean water covering this. And then the red represents places where reefs formed around here. Let's go a little more local. Here's, there's Milwaukee County Stadium, the sadly gone. Some of you have probably been there, where the brewers used to play, but there's Racine, Our Town, Wauwatosa, Grafton, etc. Everywhere there's a dot, and then down to Chicago. Let's not talk about them. But wherever the yellow is, those are the rocks of that age, representing ocean deposits, and then the red dots represent these reefs. Can you go study them like you can in Texas? Not exactly. Most of these, you know, we have beautiful farmland and forests and everything. Uh, these quarries have been filled in. They've been reclaimed. Or in the case of this place in Wauwatosa, is now an apartment complex, and they called it the Reef. So this from a news report and a TV thing from a few years ago. Did you know there's an ancient coral reef in Wauwatosa? And there's a picture of a geologist from, you know, a colleague from Milwaukee there looking at this, but it's the reef. And what's important about this, this cartoon is from a, um, a paper in 1877, T.C. Chamberlain. Uh, he later became president of the University of Wisconsin-Madison, University of Chicago. He's at the U.S. Geological Survey, all that. His very first job was at Whitewater Normal School. A few years before this, so 1869, our second year in existence to 1873, he was here, but he was the first one to look at these rocks and say, that kind of looks like a reef. So historically, we are right at dead center of the start of ancient reef study. And here's the back end. So this is a cartoon of what he saw back in the day. If he went there today... He'd see the pool area of this reef apartment complex, and it's back here. You can still go, well, I, I should say it's, it's listed as temporarily closed because there's been some rock falls that they don't want people to get hurt. But it is a preserved National Historic Site. The, it's called the Schoonmaker Reef Quarry in Wauwatosa. You can Google it. 
and tells you how to get right there. And even though it says temporarily closed, I, I still go. Because <laughs> I can always say, oh, I'm a professor, and I'm absent-minded, and I forgot. And, but, uh, yeah, you can go. So it's, it's, there it is. So if we can't study them that way, what do the students do? Well, conveniently, people like Chamberlain were people like me and people like my students. They went to these places and brought back hundreds of pounds of rock that are now deposited in museums all around the place. And for us, the primary museum is the Milwaukee Public Museum. Now, if you go there, they have that wonderful streets of old Milwaukee, right? And the butterfly area. And then there's the dinosaurs, but don't pass by the ancient Silurian reefs. They actually literally call it, you know, the reefs that made Milwaukee famous. Does that sound like that old beer ad? Again, the students don't recognize that at all anymore. <laughs> but the reefs that made Milwaukee famous, and this is part of their nice, wonderful diorama display of models of these things in this Milwaukee Public Museum. Uh, there's the public display, all of this, and again, for those of you that consider going, Thursday is free day. So not just a discount, you know, your senior discount, but actual free day paid for by Kohl's. So that's the day to go. But most of the fossils and rocks of this aren't on display. They're in the back room, and it's like the catacombs. This is just one of 20 hallways like this with drawer after drawer after drawer filled with rocks. <laughs> and fossils. I'm also an adjunct curator at the Milwaukee Public Museum, so I have access and work with these specimens here, and there's tens of thousands of beautiful specimens like this. You know, pull open any drawer and boom, the evidence is there for you to see. Fossils and fossils to study us. And so, uh, just to talk about the fate of those reefs, they weren't killed by low oxygen or oxygen destroying them. The demise of these, if this cartoon represents the reefs 425 million years ago, there they are growing under the water, these blobs or whatever. Here, sea level dropped to the point where they were no longer, they were covered by those tidal flats. Muds with shrimps and things like but not the ideal conditions for reefs. So it's another example where we can look at these things and say, well, what killed them off? And how do we do it? Well, I've had a large number of students get internships there. The Milwaukee Public Museum is very good about getting grant money. They like hiring our students. Here's three different students, and they're paid now to literally go through because there's such a backlog of these things that they've had for hundreds of years. A uh, backlog of these things to photograph them digitally and make them preserve not just as solid specimens, but things where you can show a worker in Germany or anywhere and do this. Speaking of Germany, this student right here, Alyssa Watson, who just graduated, has just started grad school in Germany. It's free tuition. Can you believe that? I can hardly believe that. But there's three different students doing different work there. And again, if you're sort of seeing in the news, that old building that the Milwaukee Public Museum is in is going away, and they're going to build a, I want to say bigger, because it's definitely going to be smaller, but it's going to be a new, brand new building closer to where the Bucks play. You know, that kind of that Fiserv area. And there's the weird architectural design it's going to have. It's supposed to look like the Dells. If you've been up to the Dells, it's supposed to look like the rock types of the Dells. That's what the building is going to look like. And it's going to house all of these things, including, and there's the artist's rendition. You know, I was part of the team that was doing the consulting on this. It's going to have a marvelous Silurian reef display. You can go there today and still see their marvelous display, but it's going to be over-the-top great and good. Okay. Whew. I talked a little bit long, but I just wanted to give you a flavor of what I do and the whole notion that reefs are important, both for what they are, how they died, how they give us resources, and then the fact that we can study them far away or close. You know, UW-Whitewater's motto used to be, stay close, go far. 
They they got rid of that. I love that. I still sell my sell that to my students. You know, you can stay close, learn this stuff, and you are prepared to go out and study these things anywhere. One last bit. This is actually Earth Science Week nationally. October 8th through the 14th is Earth Science Week. In the middle of the week, Wednesday is National Fossil Day. But this also counts as a national fossil. Any time in this week, you can use it. But Earth, thank you for joining me for Earth Science Week, National Fossil Day. If you have any questions, I'll answer. Thanks.